Welcome to Gas, Poetry, Art, and Music. I'm your host, Belinda Subramon. Hi. Hello. Nice to see you. Okay. Oops. Well, you know, Marge, it appears to me that you're still super active in the literary world. Is that true? Oh, I write a lot and I publish. Yeah. Do, are you still driven to write every day? I, I don't write Mondays. Mondays I do the laundry and deal with uh, bills and letters and stuff. Uh, was, the rest of the week I write. Was it always that way or you just decided to take a day off? <laughs> No, it's always that way. It's not a day off. I work like a dog. Oh, oh, right. I'm, I'm in on writing. <laughs> uh, well, that's interesting that you're still writing most every single day. Um, Why? What else would I do? Well, I garden, I cook, I see friends, I deal with my cats, I'm with my loving Naira. And... Well, so you well, stay super busy. Um, and you still find writing easy, absorbing, and interesting? Question mark. Of course, I wouldn't do it otherwise. Okay. I don't, I think I, I may not write another novel if I can get the one I've finished published. I've aged out of New York not with my fiction, not with my poetry, but with my fiction. Well, I did hear in a, another interview with you on YouTube that you said you made more money from your poetry than your fiction is that nowadays absolutely for a while it's been that way i i well before covid i traveled <clears throat> oh i'd go off two three times a month to give readings and my poems are reprinted a lot so i get some revenue from that but readings always now I do Zoom readings. That's how it is. Well, that's the world we're in now with uh, COVID still out there. And we've got. Oh, God, people. yes. People and, still getting it. Yeah. And uh, I think it'll be here for a while. And we've kind of gotten used to the Zoom thing, more or less. More or less. I prefer a live audience, but. I don't think that's going to happen anytime soon. No. So uh, no, I have a workshop and a Zoom reading next week. Yeah, if they come in, I do them. Do you enjoy the workshops that you, you teach? I enjoy performing more, but the workshops I teach, uh, I my favorite is the one the annual one I do every June. Except, of course, last year, but every I did it this year, every year in Lovely, which is a craft workshop. Uh, and it can raise people to a different level, Unless, except for a couple of crazies. Just about everyone who's taken the workshop after the, over the last 12 years has gotten published afterwards. <laughs> and a lot of them have had books out. Uh -huh. um so um, I, I read where New York Times called you breathtakingly ambitious, entering into historical fiction. What kind of led you into historical fiction? Trying to figure out how we got where we are now. Oh, okay. Uh, so do you find all writing is some... Well, all creative writing, I'll say that, is a sense of discovery or self-discovery. Not particularly. So more poetry than fiction. Fiction, I'm dealing with other people's lives. Uh, you, I learn a lot about whatever I'm researching. Uh -huh. Okay. Um, uh, was a uh, political organizing every ever more important to you or at least as important as as your writing yes in the 60s it was uh, and the ha part way through the 70s uh it reached a point where i could reach a lot more people with my writing than i could reach with my organizing i was a good organizer though 
And I went on creating groups on the Cape. I started four different groups. Groups tend to have an age. Unless they're tremendously well-funded and bureaucratic, they tend to go as long as enough people in it have the energy for it. Then they sort of fade out. Uh, I, I, I read too where someone was asking, if people have asked you everything I can think of a million times, but um, about your writing of poetry and fiction, and when asked, uh, what is the difference? What do you feel is the difference? Uh, <laughs> it's different between an elephant and a pussycat. Oh, yeah. Um, yeah. Or a diamond and an elephant, lots of things. Um, how would you describe that in more... Um, street language <laughs> or is that already uh, well telling fiction tells a story and for me it's based on character i create characters and then you see how their socioeconomic their political situation as they try to move on a particular trajectory how that impacts them uh, poetry is much more immediate it comes right out of your life, which you, what's on TV, what's in the radio, what's happening to your friends, what's happening outside, how are the cats, how's the garden, what's the weather, is there a hurricane coming? All these things impact the poetry in a much more personal way and more immediate way. Well, I, I know you were working on poems pretty regularly. Uh, are you also working on a novel right now? I finished the novel. I have to try to find an independent publisher for it. I haven't started looking yet. Uh, I just finished what I think is the final revision about two weeks ago. Uh, do you want to tell us just a tad about that to make us want to look for it and buy it? It's called The, the House at Hope's End. Uh, it's partly about elderly abuse, partly about land use. And what happens in a place uh, when it becomes a tourist place? Sounds very interesting. Do you have some uh, poems ready to read for us? Uh, maybe four or five or whatever you'd like. Uh, I marked three poems. Shall I read those? Yes, that would be just fine. Thank you. Good. Okay. And by the way, just to say, I've had some of your books and I've had you some of your po there was a poem one time I'm not sure where I got it that had a line in it like you have to love writing more than being loved does that ring a bell <laughs> uh, <laughs> yes that, that's for the young who want to ah uh, that's but you what you seem to have are very old books yeah, well, I also have... This is the, my most recent book is this one, which is now showing backwards. Yeah. Uh, it's, yeah, that's On the Way Out, Turn Off the Light. And that's what I'll read you three poems from. Okay. You period S period us. We force children to go to school. Schools are shooting galleries. We force children to experience death. Don't go to a concert, you might die. Don't go to the mall, you might die. Don't go to pray, you might die. Don't get in, go to the movies, you might die. Love, oh, don't go to college, you might die. Every bullet sprayed is money for some corporation. Every child who dies is profit for the NRA. Every murder brings contributions to senators, congressmen, governors who couldn't care less. How much do we care if the child bleeding out isn't ours? We live in a gun-happy country. Some grow richer. Some never come, ham, come home. Some never grow up. Inside of me is once inside of her. Lovers from decades ago, I can't conjure their faces with accuracy. My mother who died 30 years past 
The voice is still caught in my ears like a fish tangled in a weir. Her face, young, middle-aged, old, hangs in my brain like a gallery in a museum. How permanent an exhibit. Our mothers are part of our flesh, our bones. We carry them like a blessing or curse all our days. I hear myself shouting her profanity exactly when I drop an object in my foot or a zipper stuck. My life was as alien to her as if I were a giraffe or a dolphin. I've carried her into the land she couldn't imagine, into a love she dreamed of till death closed that door. My choices scared her. My sex exploits shocked her. But still, she lives in my life. The rain comes on like a tide. Maples and oaks are tossing their green tresses as rain plays kettle drums on every roof. The day, the sky is low as the ceiling of a tunnel and almost as dark. Petals litter the ground for peonies, rhododendrons. Step out, sink in. You're soaked in five minutes. Wind shoves grit into your eyes. The earth looks angry and why not? She's sick of our poisons. More wildfires, daily tornadoes, stronger hurricanes, nor'easters that tear at the coast. We've attacked our mother for centuries. Why wouldn't the weather fight us back? All right. Thank you very much. Okay, I can read anything. If, do you feel like another one? If you'd like, sure. Okay. She's letting go now. This was written about a friend. She's leaving her red shiny shoes. She's leaving her Burberry trench coat. Bought two decades ago in London with the lover she thought was her last. She has abandoned her books, carried from coast to coast and back again, with her corners of pages turned down, her snark in the margins, her question marks. She is leaving her most recent lover, although mostly they went to movies together and had supper, although sometimes he took Viagra. She, too, is often weary. She's leaving her medicine cabinet with the rows of pills that were supposed to save her. She's not leaving her brass bed, although very soon she will. She's leaving her computer full of work and emails from friends unanswered. But mostly, she worries about the faithful cat who purrs against her. Unaware, she is leaving. Thank you so much for taking some time off and uh, talking with me. I really appreciate it. Thank you well, so much. Go. Okay. All righty. Bye-bye.
from Berlin to autumn. I feel a cold wind bringing you in and my thousand different shades of response to you on this homecoming don't know where to settle. Nervous. Hungover. Needn't to be somewhere else. Preferring the waiting to the getting there. I don't know if I'm a man's woman or a woman's woman or anything at all. I feel very scattered and needing to be gathered by gentle hands. Hands which know and know me. This cold wind picking up my shades scatters me abstract across your path. Hello, my name's Angela Shanks. I live up in the northeast coast of Scotland in a little village called Helmsdale with my dog. And anyway, I'm going to read you a poem called Absolute Soup. Um, it's a philosophical poem that I wrote in response to a prompt about the female philosopher called Sarah Margaret Fuller de Sully, who lived in the 19th century in the United States. And she said many um, wise things about women, that they could be anything they wanted, even sea captains if they wished. Um, and ironically, she herself died at sea with her child um, due to their own sea captain having died on the ship. And then the first officer took over and they hit the rocks off Fire Island in, I think, 1850. Um, she also said... A house is no home unless it contains food for the fire, food and fire for the mind as well as for the body. Um, and so I was thinking about these things and I was also struggling with my own notions of absolutes, um, absolute right, absolute wrong, absolute truth. And I wrote this and it's called Absolute Soup. She stirs the cast iron pot as if a goddess or a sea captain, staring and stirring and staring as the absolutes wrangle in a melee around a single stock bone of truth. Even dead things can feed her today, flames boiling their cells to a mush suitable for undiscerning mouths. She stirs the cast iron pot as if a usurper or a great pretender Staring and stirring and staring. Divine rights, fiendish wrongs, like potatoes, they are staples. Potatoes then, potatoes now, no matter. Forever cooked to the perfect expediency of man. She tastes from her cast iron pot, as if a cynic or the newly devoid of faith. Frowning and tasting and frowning. These tubers are liars, pulses swim, beating to the vagaries of a boiling sea, amongst grains of edicts from somewhere on high. Loud liquid erupts, spurting, spouting, fury burning her cheek. She covers the cast iron pot, as if a humouring mother or a bored sister, smiling and covering up her smiling. She turns down the flames lets the absolute simmer as ever and later she will serve her men, serve them up more of what they expect whilst she eats at another table altogether.
just do uh, a short uh, excerpt uh, beginning lines from a poem called London Bridge and it's in Shakespeare's voice morning's grisly purgation upon London Bridge keens me anew for the stage the head of Danvers and blanked on pikes with rash Essex bound in hit a hideous grin mouldering in between what mask behind I abide as I pass through Southgate as the cock thrice crows to hide my true and broken spirit, as though these murders be no affair of mine. As man be cipher unto himself, a master temper a seditious lope, lest the author be invited to dance at the end of her majesty's rope. Did ye not hear? she cried. I am Richard. Know ye not that? This a breach by some play as Pratt. Dare I escape past eight, such libel does she from my meaning glean. To bow, yes, but genuflect before the queen? Poor Essex, the raven's jelly, gone from his deserted eyes. My testament, but furious whistling across his empty globe. The spurious mass that words weave, even upon our most fervent prayers, a layer of counterfeit infamy that our very howlings despair smash against such horrors that, such as it is, near break, a poet's fury seek repair. For such I am to be itself to the gate of cowards, so we fit to stand in blood ankle deep and drip black ink into it. Neither hero nor sage, a mere quince upon a stage, a, a bottom's aping a lion's roar, or flouncing a courtly voice, or better as Jacques rot, tick tock, tick tock, whore my whore. So it not be your head better confound rash tears with the nose rag of poesy. It be the perils of state attach me to anonymity. Twin canards, heresy and treason, pox us bards. A vow to keep all flowery considered speech, limbs attached, so a man grows as a hedge or tree. For ages, perhaps not sage to power, even blare of one's own time, but a cathedral to future aborigines. Thank you.
Hello, my name is Libris Monastico and I'm going to read a poem titled A Seed. Your peacock eyes belie the primal, travel to the moon and back, spy no spiritual purge, dance with liquid poets, dance with mechanical mystics. Speak of Plato's heart, how it beats still, how we still live in caves. Speak of libraries and clouds, spell illusion of motion, spell motion of illusion. Blade of a fan generating matter, vortex of solidity spinning. So fast it almost is not visible. Spiraling a trillion, trillion times per second, per second. No mass, no wave, no length, no width, no height. No sound, no smell, no taste. You are gravity and its absence. You are a seed within a, seed within a, seed within a, seed within a, seed within. Thank you. My name is Mark Blickley, and I'm going to read a monologue from my play, Paleo the Fat Free Musical, that I published separately under the title of Pandemic Prophet. Proud paleo perfect people, a fruitful and somber DOA Eve, everyone. We gather around tonight's sacred flame on this divine night for our annual commiseration of the horrific DOA, Dawn of Agriculture as we spend the night together in this holy place, speaking ancestral truths while facing yet another dawn together that shall deposit us into the increasingly brutal attempts to subjugate we PPPPs. My children, my children, come forth and purify yourself with our annual DOA Eve rebirth ritual, a pageant of truth. Help squeeze the pus out of the pimple known as humanity's darkest day, the dawn of agriculture. A blessing on all your heads on this DOA Eve, this holiest night of the year, as we echo the ancient betrayal of our true humanity as hunter-gatherers into victims of the cursed, flabby factory farming, artificial food additives, and crop failure famines. Tonight, we renew our pledge to refuse to be slapped into the shadow of sexual shame by the DOA dawn of agriculture's rape of our precious topsoil's life-giving inches of dirt amidst the fertilized stench of domesticated animal dung. Evening has given way to night. Let us not succumb to the encircling darkness that has surrounded our sacred tribe ever since that first vile, cultivated grain yeast infection rose up to mutilate our humanity. Dance to resist this molestation of grain growing and incestuous ranch animal husbandry. Dervish away the putrid DOA domesticated abomination of that very first dawn of agriculture 13,763 years ago. Better dead than bred. Homostasius in the highest. Praise be to the Lord and all other natural byproducts. Hi, Donnie. <laughs> Hello. Um, it's been nice getting to know your work on uh, Facebook and um, 
And I know you had a, a book and you've got another one coming out in October. But what I want to ask you first, um, and I know you are a gay man, which you are proudly out. Mm -hmm. um, and I know you work for uh, LGBTQ plus rights. Can you tell me something about your journey to becoming a writer and an activist? Thank you. That's a great question. I appreciate that. Uh, my, my journey began, I would say, when I was in high school, when I started discovering that I enjoyed writing a lot. And it really didn't take off until college when I started involving myself in organizations, um, like, like our local GSA organization, so on and so forth. And the truth is, I, I really felt insecure with my voice, with expressing it. And coming from a rural area, like I was often, let's just say, encouraged to be silent about everything. And I discovered that through writing, it was a convenient way for me to not be silent, but still express myself in the way that I needed to express. And that's what led me into activism as well. Uh, a mentor, which my first book, Carbon Footprint, is dedicated to, um, his name was Ace London. He was an actor, an uh, LGBTQ plus rights activist. And um, he really encouraged my voice when I was in college. Like he always would say, Donnie, you are who you've been becoming. And he would, he would just, he would tell me like that the closet was behind me and that the road was ahead. And that encouraged me to be more vocal and to pass that on to, you know, new writers or even my students that I work with all the time. Uh, would you tell me something about restitching the tapestry and your Donnie Winter YouTube channel? Yes, of course. So my my YouTube channel I have been doing for probably ten years now. I do vlogging. I, I love talking about current events, pop cultural related things, mental health is something I talk about a lot as well. Restitching the Tapestry is a podcast series, a live podcast series that my dear friend Ari Whipple and I created last year um, when the uh, atrocities were happening early on in like late May and, and early June. And we wanted to use our privilege in order to not only educate ourselves, but also educate viewers on the different things that affect various marginalized communities. And we've we've done over 50 episodes so far. It's been well received and, and I enjoy it. It's, it's another outlet for me, similar to poetry being an outlet for me. And you also have uh, Donnie Speaks, which is a separate channel, which is that you presenting your poetry or something more? Yes, uh, Donnie Speaks is 100% dedicated to my poetry. I, I use it to post like random poems, but I also use it for the promotional cycle of my books as I release them, because I, I think it's nice to have a space to have just specific outlets, you know. So Donnie Speaks is my place to go when I want to put some poetry out in the world. And uh, I did look at some of the videos on both the sites and um, the first one I saw or the last one you, you posted, you were talking about Godzilla, was it, or something like that? And I know you have some sci-fi mixed in with your poetry in the book coming out. So do you have a facts, fascination with sci-fi and how did, how did that get going? And it worked as well <laughs> poetry. That's a great question. I fixate over many different things, but I've been a huge fan of Godzilla since I was a kid, not just because he's this large, you know, lumbering creature, but because of the metaphorical aspects to the character. He's anomalous. He is created through human failing. And I, I really tap into that, especially in my upcoming collection, Feats of Alchemy, because as a gay man, I have often been made to feel like I am this anomalous creature who has no sense of belonging. Um, marginalized, of course, and sometimes like people fear that. People treat um, individuals that they aren't really familiar with or have an identity that they're not comfortable with 
as monsters of sorts, and that really takes shape in feats of alchemy. Uh, do you have um, some poems ready? And do you have uh, one of your sci-fi interwoven poems? Because I'm interested to see what you do with that. I do. I, I do have one of them ready. <laughs> okay, and uh, you can go ahead and uh, read two or three and, and tell if you need to say something about it or go ahead and do that too. Of course. Thank you. I appreciate it. Um, so the first poem that I'm going to be reading is from my upcoming collection, Feats of Alchemy. And throughout the collection, I really focus not only on like the state of being a monster, but also the cyborg. The cyborg is a type of character that we see crop up in so many different media, not just sci-fi. And it's usually this person who, or thing, who has gone through some sort of involuntary reanimation, who has been made into something else from something prior. You know, and as a gay man, I really could relate with that concept because coming out and growing up as an LGBTQ plus person and navigating adulthood, I, like I feel like I've had to create like these artificial aspects of myself in order to assimilate to different social spaces. So um, this poem is titled The Unsalvaged Body, Biotic and Broken. Tonight, lover, you're a cyberneticist. These cogs have grown brittle from disuse, and the chemicals in these vessels are no substitute for the blood that once flowed. Tonight, lover, you're a curator. This body is a museum with rusted gears forged long ago, with soldered computer chips bereft of lithium ion heft. Tonight, lover, you're my alchemist. I'm a steampunk automaton splayed across this bed, and I regret that you're charged with my maintenance, but I know you'll salvage me. I know you'll raise me from the dead. All right. Yeah. So just to add a little bit of context to that piece, I, I really wanted to illustrate how a lot of people view LGBTQ plus people as being broken. And a lot of people in our lives often have to navigate the trauma that we have. And like, I, I kind of look at those people as being, you know, very kindred spirits who are here to just provide us some sort of sense of belonging as we navigate our trauma. So that's, I would say, where that poem comes from. Okay. So um, the next one is a poem from my first book, Carbon Footprint, which came out last fall. Um, and it is the last poem in the book that I dedicated to um, the, my mentor, my mentor, Ace London, and it's called My Closet is a Reliquary. The closet door has fallen from its track and sits, leaned against the dented drywall like a discarded portcullis, too weathered to keep me. Behind box stack skyscrapers, yellowed wallpaper peels and the crayon mural still robs floral print of its optic illusion, like a political graffiti with elementary verve. The shelves still dip under collections of unread religious texts and the bloated plastic drawers refuse to budge from their cheap retail compartments as each paper-filled basin brims. The air is linen stale and the glued constellations above still keep this room lit while the tired July sun slips beneath the tree line, lengthening each shadow across the brown shag carpet. These years later, I keep the closet door off its track because it's powerless, a prison made museum, a memorialized womb left open since I left for college after a second birth. And now, my closet has lost its echo, and each stored memory maps a misshapen journey, 
So let these paper roadways return to nature, become overgrown, because this cluttered closet is a reliquary, a room for storage, unable to keep me. Oh, thank you so much. Um, thank you. Uh, really nice to hear you read and thank you for talking with me. It means a lot. Thank you for having me. All right. Bye-bye. Bye. Synesthesia and the River Song. Age four, I was called by the wounded earth smell of a freshly trimmed hedge, the way honey sounds under a full moon breathing, my grandma's scent of polka dots. At the portal to fluid reality, my karma scope cast lots of glad kindness and legend seeping through me. If I could take this book, if I could start a new, I would take some black, I would hear the blue. If I could live again, another heart's day I would feel remember sickness, every childhood disease, and talking to aliens, probably delirious with fever. But I remember there was magic in a mimosa tree and a belting for sharing knowledge of my anointment. They cut the tree down and forbade the utterance of anything not biblical. said little for years, afraid of my tongue and shadows greater than my own. I'm past the noise of tidiness, posted regulations through 40 translations, and constant derailment of what I might have been without cruelty and jumbled senses. From tasting pain and everything picked and dying to now. It is the voice of the rock, not the river I hear with cinnamon, periscope eyes. Thank you for listening and watching Gas, Poetry, Art, and Music. If you'd like to encourage us, please subscribe to our channel, like, comment if you will, share, and tell your friends about our project. And we hope to see you next time.